model of epistemic curiosity today. And um, the talk is co-authored by Bennett Schwartz and Tia Like. And I am happy to thank Trevor uh, Kennedy and Matt Ivoir as well for uh, this. Okay, here's the overview. Um, first of all, I'm going to try to define or dance around defining epistemic curiosity. Then I'm going to go through three theoretical perspectives, um, a reinforcement learning prediction error model, and six problems that we've got with that model. Um, then I'm going to look at a modified uh, prediction error model, which is, brings in metacognition. And finally, I'm going to look at a region of proximal learning model, which is the one I cha champion here. Uh, then I'm going to look at four uh, kinds of evidence that bear on the distinctions among these models, and I'll reach a conclusion. So the first is, what's epistemic curiosity? Well, when we think of curiosity, we think of people like Isaac Newton um, and, you know, the apple. Why was he so interested in the apple? Right? There's something going on there that's really important for our culture and for our minds. We think of Albert Einstein, of course. Albert Einstein said, there's nothing really special about me except that I'm extremely curious. And that may be so. Curiosity may have some kind of very important component, add a important component that we wouldn't otherwise have. Okay, with epistemic curiosity, there's a question. So even Berlin, who was a behaviorist himself, said that it's driven by a question that the individual wants to know the answer to. The Oxford English Dictionary says it's a strong desire to know or learn something, and there's a something there. Um, and every, I'll give you a couple of everyday examples. Um, for example, you might be asked a question, in what state is the Statue of Liberty? You might just want to know. Hmm. Well, so you conjure up a map. And there's New York up here, if I can get this working. There's New York. This is, there's Brooklyn. Okay, Manhattan. Uh, New Jersey. And there's the Statue of Liberty. Hmm. And then you zoom a little bit closer. And isn't that weird? First of all, they're saying here located in New York. But New York and New Jersey split right down the middle there. But that's, what's this little dot around the island? Well, look again, New York, New Jersey. There's been an ongoing battle. Maybe you're gonna look this up later. That's my guess. There's been an ongoing battle between New York and New Jersey for hundreds of years over this issue. And people think they know. I had a woman in my lab who came from New Jersey, and her claim was, as you can imagine, I come from New York, it's New York, obviously. Okay, to explore curiosity in the laboratory, researchers often use general information questions, such as, what animal can eat only with its head upside down, okay? They use stumpers, they use magic tricks. And if you, you can click on this later, I'm not gonna be able to manage the logistics, but there are some magic tricks that you can look at. People are really curious about magic tricks. But there's, all, in terms of epistemic curiosity, there's a question. So epistemic curiosity, and this is the only thing that I'm going to look at, is not just information seeking. So eye movements don't count for epistemic curiosity, unless your eye is moving in order to try to find the answer to a question. So Berlin made the distinction between perceptual and epistemic curiosity, and I'm gonna make that distinction here too. And the thing that we study in the lab when you Google curiosity or when you go on Clio or whatever you go on is, um, the kind of curiosity where people are seeking the answer to get some information. We'll look at its consequences. There are a couple of theoretical perspectives that I want to go through. And I think the first is probably 
the dominant perspective with the modification. The first perspective was championed by Berline and um, has had some dominance ever since. It's the reinforcement learning reward prediction error view of curiosity. So reinforcement learning in neural networks is thought to be governed by prediction error. And value related, there, there are value related um, prediction error models that have been applied to curiosity and there are quite a few of them and they're not that old. Okay, so people are still working on this. It's not a straw man. Uh, oh, I've done something bad here. There we go. Okay, why is this view appealing? Well, first of all, it's rewarding. Curiosity is rewarding. It's fun to get the answer. Um, second of all, people have done uh, neuropsych neuro neuro studies in which they have found that the dopamine system is activated. And the dopamine system is activated with reward reinforcement learning. Animals show this. You can, I mean, there's, there's really no question about that. And curiosity does lead to enhanced learning. Okay, so it feels like reinforcement learning, reward learning seems to have this appeal. Um, I have some problems with it and I'm going to give you a critique. Um, but first of all, the basic idea is that curiosity in this view is related to uncertainty reduction. The more the person expects their uncertainty to be reduced when they get the answer, the more curious they will be. And that's what we're going to look at when, we, when I get to the evidence. So the further away you are from knowing, the more your uncertainty and the greater will be the expected uncertainty reduction when you're told the answer, right? So if we were to plot information, you've mastered, you've already got the answer versus you've got a lot of information, a moderate amount of information or low information. When you have low information, you have the most uncertainty and you should be the most curious. And as you get to more and more information, you should become less and less curious. So that's a prediction. Um, the experiment, so let's just go to the reinforcement paradigm that we've studied in psychology for years, because both, um, I'm gonna mainly here refer to operant conditioning, but there's also classical conditioning. Basically, you can play it for, for both. The experimenter, but for operant, the experimenter wants to train an animal to do something like peck a square. And so every time it does that, or comes close to doing that, the animal gets a treat or a reinforcer. This reward, and the animal likes or wants this reward or values this reward, makes the preceding behavior stronger. That is, learning occurs. The dopamine system is implicated in this. And as trials go on, the animal gets better and better and faster and faster at the behavior leading up to the pleasant, rewarding treat. And reinforcement learning is said to have occurred. Um, a friend of mine, Rob Hampton, who studies animal metacognition, is quarantined right now. And so to amuse himself, he set up a um, he set up a little reinforcement learning in his backyard. And he sent me this video of his pigeons. I don't know whether I can play it from here or not. Let me see. Uh, so there they are, they're reinforced. They're pecking, getting the treat. Okay, they're hard workers. So that's the model of, it does this work for human epistemic curiosity. Problem one, first, what's being reinforced or strengthened? People are not being taught curiosity itself. Curiosity is assumed to be a pre-existing drive, which under particular conditions simply exists like hunger or thirst in drive models, and reinforcement models. 
They're not learning to do anything akin to salivating to a tone or other classically conditioned responses or consolidating action patterns to peck the square, okay? Um, it's also not the mental pathways that are leading to the answer that are being entrenched as habits of thoughts. If you were to do that to get the answer to the particular question that you're asking, the next time you felt that curiosity, you would get to the wrong answer, okay? So it doesn't, it's not that. In epistemic curiosity situations, it's the goal or the answer itself that's learned. And that's not what's learned in reinforcement learning. It's rather how to get to the answer that's learned in reinforcement learning. So you're training what to do to get the answer, not the answer. Second, um, knowledge of the goal. So unlike in reinforcement uh, learning paradigms, in epistemic curiosity situations where you're being asked a question, the goal, the answer itself, is unknown and it's necessarily unknown okay and that isn't the case in reinforcement learning as soon as it's known people aren't interested anymore and it you know so so what is the knowledge of the goal is intrinsically different in these two situations um, the answer is learned in a single trial rather than in many trials as soon as you know that it's really new york if you believe me, it's New York. <laughs> okay. Um, the motivational consequences are different. Um, Gruber and Ranganath, who are prominent curiosity researchers, noted, quote, one key difference between states of curiosity and states associated with reward motivation is that reward delivery is generally thought to motivate future behavior that leads to the same reward. By contrast, information that completely resolves uncertainty no longer motivates exploratory behavior. So once you've got it, you're quenched. Um, problem five, the reward value of the answer is qualitatively different Oops, we need to go. than a basic reward. Although getting the answer is maybe pleasurable, although Lowenstein says sometimes it's not, sometimes it's disappointing and sad, um, so that still isn't resolved, but it may be pleasurable. The pleasure is not necessarily attributed to the value of the information. So there's value in this uh, reinforcement framework. It can occur with trivial or even silly answers. So in our lab, one of the questions that people are very curious about is what US vice president called liberals, pampered prodigies and pusillanimous pusillanimous pussyfooters. And there's a hint, to, I don't know whether you can see it, I can't for, my, for seeing you, but um, it's not Pence, right? Okay, they're very curious to know. It's silly, who cares? Uh, he also supercilious sophisticates, just in case any of you are liberals. Um, this was, this guy until recently was known as the worst vice president ever. Problem six, um, it's reverse inference from the dopamine data. While curiosity does activate the striatal dopamine system, even if that activation were unique in specifying reinforcement learning, which it isn't, it's also the curiosity brain response, it also implicates frontal lobes and hippocampus. So it's not the only thing. And there's a problem seven, which I didn't put in the slides, but the thing that, that worries me most about it and that sort of is sort of deeply contradictory in a certain way is the passivity that's implied by reinforcement learning. And I see curiosity as being a really deeply active process rather than a passive process. Okay, first theory, um, gap theory. Uh, the second, sorry, the second theory, um, there's something wrong with the reinforcement, I think. Um, although, you know, we don't know. Um, Lowenstein came up with this, uh, modif uh, a modification 
in which he emphasized the role of metacognition. And what Lowenstein said is that a failure to appreciate what one does not know would constitute an absolute barrier to curiosity. So that's metacognitive. You have to know that you don't know in order to be curious at all. And I think that's a deep insight, actually. You know, there are a lot of things that we just don't know at all. And, you know, astrophysics, maybe some of you do know, <laughs> but um, things that you really have no clue about and that you don't even know that you don't know, he thinks constitute an absolute barrier to curiosity. So if we now take this information down here, we have to change it to a metacognitive judgment, okay? But does that change the predictions? Lowenstein still holds on to a prediction error view. And what he says is that there's something going, something else going on, there's this gap. Um, Kang et al. described this best. I find it actually kind of difficult to understand, but Kang and Lowenstein was on this paper. So Kang described the gap as follows, that the aspired to level of knowledge increases sharply with a small increase in knowledge so that the information gap grows with initial learning. When one is sufficiently knowledgeable, however, the gap shrinks and curiosity falls. If curiosity is like a hunger for knowledge, then a small priming dose of information increases the hunger and the de decreasing curiosity from knowing a lot is like being satiated by information. So he's still holding on to the prediction error view, but there's this thing going on at the end. And this is the priming dose. So at very low end, if you realize that you don't know, then you very quickly become very curious. But then as you get more information, your curiosity decreases, according to this view. And this is now a metacognitive judgment. Um, OK, the third model that I'll mention that I'll talk about and that I champion is the region of proximal learning model. Um, the region of proximal learning model is in line with a number of very distinguished thinkers. Piaget talked about the idea that you, um, when you're, when he was contrasting assimilation and accommodation, you can accommodate to those things rather than just assimilate. You can accommodate to those things that are just a little bit beyond what you know. But they're very close to what you know. You can't go very far away. So there has to be only a small amount of uncertainty for you to be able to change in order to find out new information and learn new information. Uh, Richard Atkinson, who um, was the president of the University of California system and the director of NSF and a very, very distinguished mathematical psychologist, devised one of the first models of human, computer models of human learning. And he had a transition zone so that, you know, if the person knew very, very well and things were very well integrated, uh, they didn't get any benefit from learning those things because they knew them already. And if they were so far away from knowing them that they didn't have, in Piaget, in terms of schemas to be able to assimilate them, they didn't get much benefit from learning those either. They learned best when they almost knew the answer. And he called these transition items. And Vygotsky did almost the same thing, but in terms of language. So... So the region of proximal learning view makes a really different prediction from the um, uh, prediction error models. And what it says is that this line, this curiosity line goes the other way, the other direction. So if you've absolutely mastered, you're not curious at all. And then there's a sharp break. 
And the sharp break is between knowing and having absolutely mastered and having very a lot of information, very high judgment of learning, but not over the threshold. And then as you have less and less metacognitive knowledge that you know, your judgment of your uh, curiosity goes down. Now this is gonna get smeared, of course, if you look over subjects, okay? But the crucial difference is that the predictionary view and the modified predictionary view both say that as you have less and less knowledge, you're more and more curious up to a point with one of them and completely all the way through with the straight predictionary view. And the region of proximal learning model says that you have a decreasing function. Okay, so they go in the opposite direction. So the question is, do people, and there's a little, there's a threshold here. So remember that for, for later, that, that you may be able to say when you're going to make decisions in this. Okay, um, so we're gonna look at evidence then that bears on, does this go this way or does it go this way? Okay. Evidence. So first of all, there are differences in mind wandering. Um, mind wandering can be taken as the opposite of curiosity. When, when the person just isn't interested at all, they mind wander and start thinking about something else. If you're really curious about something, you want to study it as per the definition, and um, you don't, you, you, you'll work on it, you know. Um, okay, Judy Zhu did some studies looking at differences in mind wandering and the region of proximal learning. What she found, and she did this in a couple of experiments, but this is maybe the, the, the cleanest for, for, from our perspective. She varied the difficulty of the materials. And the dark blue lines are difficulty. And she looked at mind wandering. And what she found was that with very difficult materials, where people should be most curious, if you're talking about prediction error models, People mind wandered. And when they were easy, well, some people mind wandered when they were easy, but they may have known those materials already. They were things like Spanish, English pairs. And if you know Spanish, you're in pretty good shape on those and they're over the knowledge barrier. Where they didn't mind wander were for the items in the middle, which she called the RPL items in these two cases. She did an analysis that looked at subject expertise. Now this should matter because if you're a Spanish speaker, the, 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 the um, I don't know whether you can see on the bottom here, we've got um, how expert the person is. So at the far right end of each of these, you've got experts. And uh, at the um, left end, you've got people who are novices. And Mind wandering is the opposite. Remember, it's the opposite of curiosity. So when the materials are easy, there's not much mind wandering, but there's more mind wandering for the people who are experts. When the materials are very difficult, that's when the non-experts, the novices are mind wandering. It's too far for them. So it's the opposite pattern of what, you, particularly this is the opposite pattern. And that's when people who are experts it's right on the boundary for them. They almost know those items. And so that's when they're, they're not mind wandering, they're curious. Um, this is an event related potential study that she also did, which shows the difference in um, brain activation um, when you're mind wandering, which is the dotted line, versus when you're not mind wandering. So you recruit this late positivity that's been associated with encoding, but you recruit it more when you're not mind wanting, when you're on task or when you're curious. Okay, second. Um, study choices um, based on metacognition. There's been, been some lovely work by Nate Cornell on this topic. And it again, he is able to contrast which, you know, are they paying attention to their low judgments of learning as discrepancy reduction would have it? 
or their high judgments of learning, as RPL would have it. So the paradigm that Nate devised was one in which he would test people on a lot of materials and he would ask for their, he, if they knew the answer, so if they were way up here, they were excluded from the experiment. So he's looking only in this area or this area, right? So everything that's mastered that they knew already was eliminated. And he asked, as he tested them the first time around, what their feeling of knowing or their judgment of learning was for the answer. Do they know, do they have something that's telling them that they, they might have some information or, or not, or is it really unknown? So he collected metacognitive judgments of learning. And then he um, had the computer rank order the um, judgments of learning into high and low. And he set up tests for choices of six items. And the six items spanned the entire range from low to high. So he, he got three high, three low, okay, in each sextet. And people had to choose from a random circle of questions which ones they wanted to study. And they, they had just shown that they didn't know them. So they were free to choose what they want. Now, choosing what you want is curiosity. You choose what you're curious about, okay? So, and what he found when he did that, and then you could look at, they were only allowed to choose three in each sextet, so it was clean. And he looked at what's their, were they choosing their low JOLs or their high JOLs? And what he found was a very strong correlation with choosing the high JOLs. So they chose the stuff that was up here and they did not choose the stuff that was down here. Okay, there's more. Um, there was actually a big difference between the choice JOL and it went in the direction for RPL. Um, there's more. After people chose, they were either, their choices were either honored or they were dishonored. So they were allowed now to study half of the items and the computer either gave them their high judgments of learning or their low judgments of learning, okay? Because they knew what the JOLs are or, and you can look at what, you know, what happens, but or gave them what they chose or what they failed to choose, what they, they admitted. And then they look, he looked at later how well they did. And the honor choice here is when Nate, this is their perf test performance later, the honor choice is when he gave them what they chose. The high JOL is actually even better. He gave them their highest judgments of learning. They were tested on everything. And the low JOL and the dishonor choice were about the same. So what we see is, so their, their choices were either honored or dishonored, they studied and they were tested and their choices were the right choices. It's where they learned best. Okay, high confidence errors. Um, Tia Like Madivoire and Emily Towner collaborated on this. Now high confidence error is a really interesting thing. We've done tons of research in our lab on this issue. And if you ask people um, to questions, trivia questions, general information questions, and you ask them, they give the answer, and you ask them to make a confidence judgment about how sure they are that their answer is true, sometimes they're wrong. Usually when they're wrong, they have very low confidence that their answer is true, but sometimes when they're wrong, they have high confidence that they're right. It, um, it turns out that when they have high confidence that they're right, they give the wrong answer, but they have a great deal of information about the right answer. And it's the wrong answer is very close in semantic space to the right answer. Um, if you say, no, you're wrong, and you get them a second guess, they'll come up with the right answer more if they were highly confident than if they had low confidence. So there's reason to suppose that high confidence errors are in this region of proximal learning, but they don't know it. 
So we did a study and in that study, we just looked at curiosity. We gave them feedback that they were wrong. And then we asked them, are you curious to know the answer? And what you get is this lovely function and everybody shows it. And there's more to this story, but I'm not gonna tell you the, the remainder um, just because we don't have a lot of time. But hopefully it'll be in JP General soon. So check it. Finally, um, the tip of the tongue state. The tip of the tongue state, by definition, is in the region of proximal learning. You know, you almost know it's right there. You almost know, and you will resolve this. So we looked at whether, and this is research done with Bennett Schwartz and others. We looked at whether people um, were curious to know the answer. We simply asked them the question. Uh, usually, tip of the tongue states will get eliminated from the curiosity data. And so, oddly, it was the first time it had been done. They're hard to get. It's, I, I think it's not, there's, there's nothing really nefarious going on there. Um, they're hard to get because they resolve fairly readily. So we were able to get people into t reliably into tip of the tongue states and uh, ask them for their, whether they wanted to know the answer or not. And what you see is that they, the black lines are the tip of the tongue state. Um, sometimes, interestingly, people are in tip of the tongue states even when they're correct. So they're not across their own metacognitive threshold because they're not sure enough of their answer to say, I've got it mastered. And when they are in a tip of the tongue state when they're correct, they're very interested to know the answer. They're almost twice as likely to want to know the answer when they're in a tip of the tongue state if they've made an error of omission, of commission, or when they're correct and when they're not. And once again, when you give them the answer, we see this same pattern that we saw with the mind wandering. And that is when you give them the answer after they were in a uh, tip of the tongue state and they were curious, they um, showed this late encoding positivity potential and they remember it very, very well. Like all studies have shown that the people remember the answer to questions when they were in a tip of the tongue state. All right, conclusion. Okay, this isn't going to be that easy. <laughs> um, I need to get this over to. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just having a little trouble organizing. I'm going to step you through in the conclusion what I think is going on. So this is the model. So here's what I think is going on. When you get a query or a question, what you do is integrate all the information that you can and you integrate it from every source. So there may be sensory information, you may have information from semantic or episodic memory. There's external information you may Google at that point. There's emotional information. There are cues that cues may not even be relevant to the answer, but you try to put everything together. There's answer related information. You do everything that you can to try to get the answer. Then you make a decision. Have you got the answer? And if the answer is yes, you get a you you um, give the answer. You experience some reward. You learn, and you may have an increased dispositional um, curiosity. Okay, and you go on to the next question. If you don't get the answer, okay. You've accumulated all this information, but you don't have the answer, so we're no here. That's when we have a metacognitive decision. Is the activation above the metacognitive criterion? And here's the criterion, okay? You don't have the answer. Is it higher than this? Is it in the region of proximal learning? If the answer to that is no, you give up and you mind wander and you go, or you may go on to the next question, okay? If you can't go on to the next question, you mind wander, you do something else. If the answer is yes, you experience curiosity and you start seeking more information. So, and you can seek information from every source that you can. 
You then integrate that information and you try again. Maybe you're going to get it this time. Maybe you're not. Maybe you've fallen out of the region of proximal learning and you give up and mind wander. Maybe you've got more information and you go back and seek again. Okay. Um, the only thing that I haven't said is where, um, is where, what happens if you make a high confidence error? So if you give the, the question, you integrate everything you can, you come up with something, you think you've got it, but you find out that you haven't, you're now going to be pushed down here. And then you ask, is the activation above the criterion, which it nearly always will be. So people are highly, highly uh, curious about high confidence errors having been pushed down into this, tri this uh, diamond. Okay. Um, okay, we started with Einstein and Newton, but with all due respect to them, Leonardo da Vinci is thought by many to have been the most curious person ever. And his curiosity was the source of his genius. So I'm going to leave you with the words of Schopenhauer on Leonardo da Vinci. Talent is like the marksman who hits a target that others cannot reach. Genius is like the marksman who hits a target which others cannot even see. And I think curiosity may be really important because it gives us some kind of leverage on being able to see things that we might not normally be able to see. There's Leonardo. Thank you.